and welcome to Fintech Insider Insights. My name is David Breer. I'm the group CEO here at 11FS. In today's show, in partnership with Thread, we are asking how much does big tech shake up the payments industry? It's often said that with every new feature, Apple can wipe out about 100 startups just trying to do the same thing. But the relationship between financial services and big tech is way more complicated than that. Between partnerships, acquisitions, back-end processes, and public fallouts, there is always a lot of ways that these two industries can actually cross over and fundamentally influence each other in that way as well. So in this show today, we've put together a panel of amazing guests to discuss how has the relationship developed to date? What are the challenges in that relationship? And what does the future look like for big tech in the payments industry? We'll discuss all of this and much, much more. But first, a few quick brief messages. Don't go anywhere. 11FS has been voted Consultancy of the Year at the British Bank Awards for a fourth time. We are super excited about bringing home the trophy, and it means more knowing that it is our clients that are the ones who voted for us. Digital financial services may only be 1% finished, but we're working with banks, fintechs, and everybody in between to chip away at the 99% still to go. And moments like this really tell us that we're on the right track. If you want to work with an award-winning team to build game-changing propositions, then let's chat. 11FS Ventures is home to industry experts across embedded finance, customer experience, digital strategy, bank building, and so much more. Kickstart your next project today and visit 11FS.com forward slash ventures. That's 11FS.com forward slash ventures. Let's get started. As always, I'm joined by a super duper awesome panel of amazing guests that the producers have put together to shed some light on this question. And first off, it is a Fintech Insider debut here for Jim McCarthy, who is the EVP of Product and Sales over at Thread. How's it going, Jim? I mean, it's been a week since we chatted in Amsterdam, but uh, but how, how's things? Uh, I'm avoiding heat strokes are going pretty well. Thanks. <laughs> I know London summertime. It's uh, it, it really is a trip, isn't it? You joined us recently on Spotlight, as we said over in uh, in Amsterdam. But what can you tell our, our listeners about Thread uh, and your role? Yeah, so Thread is the rebranding of a company a lot of people here in the UK would know, GPS, uh, Global Processing uh, Services. It was the, the real power behind the fintech ecosystem, both here in the UK as well as across uh, Europe and parts of Asia. So the likes of Starling, Monzo, Revolut all, all grew up on, on our processing platform. So uh, rebranded to recognize the kind of where we're headed next, which is across the globe with a, a, a fuller set of services. How's that rebranding going? I've, uh, I've already had all of my uh, swag that I stole from your stage, the the socks my daughter stole immediately. So like, the, but the rebranding looks like it's going really well. It's gone really well. The reception in, in, in um, uh, Amsterdam was wonderful. Clients, uh, customers, prospects really liked it. Fantastic. I love the play on words. Uh, we also have a FinTech Insider debut for Alexandra Rivas-Gale, who is the International Payments Product Lead over at ClearBank. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Doing well. I'm also trying to cope with the heat, even though I'm a California native. It's very hot in London at the moment. Yeah, we're, we're, I mean, it, it's hot in lots of places, but London's just not good at dealing with it, really, is it? It's uh, we're, we're right in the territory of the uh, headlines about roads melting, aren't we, basically? But uh, uh, but thank you very much for, for making the time and joining us. Um, what should our audience know about ClearBank? Yeah, absolutely. So ClearBank, we're purpose-built, technology-first clearing bank. So we're a fully licensed banking institution providing instant payments, real-time payments, and banking services to financial institutions. So... You know, ClearBank, we're really an infrastructure bank that sits in the background. We're connected to all the UK bank clearing schemes, and we provide accounts at scale. So, you know, it's been a tremendous journey from ClearBank over the last few years. You know, we were recognized by Deloitte in 2021 as the fastest growing tech company in the UK. And in 2022, we became profitable. So it's been a really exciting journey here, here at ClearBank. Very cool. And it's been amazing to see that that transition. I mean, from uh, 
from Nick Ogden saying he thinks he's got a good idea over his kitchen table uh, eight years ago to, uh, to to where you guys are at today. It's uh, been an amazing journey. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And last but by no means least, we have another FinTech Insider debut here. We have John Lambert, who is the Chief Digital Officer over at MasterCard. Great to have you on the show. How's it going? Thank you for having us. And uh, like my colleagues, warm, but I'll, I'll take the blue skies and the heat any day over, over the gloom that we get uh, a couple of months in the year here. Yeah, 99% of the rest of the year, it, we uh, complain about it being cold, don't we? Um, but um, f- tell us a little bit more about your role over in MasterCard. That's uh, that's a, a, a huge company and a chief digital officer over there. That's a, that's a great title. Yeah, so we're a, we're a 60-year-old fintech. Uh, uh, we have we connect about 3 billion consumers with about uh, uh, 102 uh, million merchants. My role is really to help uh, the digital transition over the years. And obviously, uh, when you tap in to the tube uh, here in London or when you buy a pair of shorts in Dhaka, that's that's where uh, with your phone or with any digital device, that's what we do with our products and services, trying to make this seamless and convenient as well as uh, highly, highly secure. Very cool. Lots of things that we'll unpack on this as well as we go through the the, the show. So thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Um, maybe if we start off by looking at if we're going to unpack that that question and, and actually unpack all of your roles a little bit more in terms of what you're trying to do in the the fabric of, of financial services, then the the landscape and the relationship between you know big payments uh, services and and the big tech players today. I mean, it's it's quite a, an interesting road, and and obviously I, I know Jim from your background, you've you've sort of trodden different parts of uh, parts of that path ra- rather, but. How do we really define big tech in that sense? What is the what's the the way we should sort of encapsulate that for the? For well, the I, I think it's changing, right? We're sitting here in a world of generative AI, um, which could be very disruptive. But I think, at least in the context of let's say the last twenty years or so, you know, Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook, um, Google um, are kind of the the group that everyone thinks of primarily because of the the scale that they've gotten and and, and some deg- some depending where you sit either the benefit they provide or the control they have which which gets the regulators going but but I think I think the world changes very quickly I started my career at IBM and lived through you know the back end of a lot of DOJ um, you know discussions you know Microsoft you could throw in there too has also been broken up and and, and continue to to thrive so uh, you know as much as big tech is defined in the moment I've lived long enough to see waves of change, and I, 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 as I say here today, I think more is coming. Yeah, I mean it's interesting, isn't it? There, there's a sense of too big tech with the, uh, as you say, with the sort of monopolies and structure getting broken down around those things. I guess um, traditionally people have talked about, as you said, GAFA, which I guess the F in GAFA was Facebook, which they've. Is that gamma now? So yeah. they're like gamma. Is that the thing we're given? It? It's called meta, I guess. But uh, but really, I guess it's anybody who's really dominating the the customer touch points, isn't it? That's the rise of you know uh, Microsoft, the rise of Apple. Yep. You know that dominance of distribution really, and when it comes to a customer, for sure. But they didn't get there through market power. They got there by consumers and businesses choosing. As a matter of fact, going back to my IBM days, I mean, Apple was was kind of dying at one point. They were going, they became an education, you know, software business, software and, and, and hardware business, only to reinvent themselves. And I'm sure we'll talk about it and unpack their role uh, since 2007 with the iPhone. Uh, and e- even now what they've done with the AR, VR headsets. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Jorn will talk about like how the, uh, Mastercard's already thinking about you know uh, what that means for commerce in in the AR VR meta world. So, so look look, I've, I've been around long enough to uh, you know, regulators are usually behind the curve and they get scared of these things that have gotten big. But those things got big for a reason. Um, and as as quickly as they got big, I would argue innovation wipes wipes the slate clean. So uh, you, you're constantly having to reinvent yourself. Yeah. John, how do you guys think about big tech in in the the financial services industry perspective? Because obviously, I mean, you guys don't just work with big financial services players. You work with people who are trying to get big into financial services as well, right? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're a network where we're there at the end of the day to make sure that consumers can pay when they want in a secure way and make sure that merchants can sell uh, what they want in a very secure and, and, uh, and convenient way. And therefore, you know, Given that this big tech is frankly unassailable in a number of experiences, we have to work with them. We actually like to work with them in the sense that they offer great consumer experiences. They offer device capability like biometrics, which are highly secure. But they've also 
enable new business models like the gig economy or like uh, subscription economy that didn't exist or that would have previously been uh, in cash. So, so they're an enabler. But I would say, though, that payments is different than perhaps some other industries. I mean, yes, Netflix killed Blockbuster, um, and that's a pure replacement. Here, I, I, so far at least, I consider them more of a lubricant in a way, because um, in any payment, there is still the issuer of the payment instrument uh, that services the consumer. There's still the uh, the bank of the merchants, and the tooling in between uh, through these uh, big tech becomes better, faster, uh, more efficient, more secure, uh, more convenient. But the foundation is not completely disrupted, like for the video streaming. So it's it's always been a very wide ecosystem. There is the bank, there is the car manufacturers, there's the terminal manufacturers, there's another bank on the other side, there's a whole series, and now there's an, an additional player there that enables uh, that payment to go through as well. You know, just adding to that point, um, you know, Apple Pay is oftentimes thought of and positioned as a, a, a new payment method. You know, people like to talk about the number of Apple Pay devices, but their Visa and MasterCard and American Express cards that are in there. And Apple's actually partnered with the networks to get that into the market because they want to avoid replicating and trying to, to compete for over 50, 60 years of growth that, that Jorn was describing earlier. So, so it's actually, to, to the point, it's very symbiotic. Uh, and they actually are, are providing a set of services that that otherwise you know would would be very um, balkanized in terms of hard, hardware manufacturers, the telcos domestically. It it, it actually it is very symbiotic. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting point. I mean you bring up Apple Pay. I mean has Apple Pay and you know Google Pay and you know whatever handset provider you'd like to like to buy has that fundamentally changed the payments landscape now? I mean. It, uh, I presume we all use it. I mean, I tapped in and out of the underground. It's super easy to do. It's, it, but it hasn't changed the fact that I would do it. It's just changed the fact that I'm doing it with them, right? So, is is it that is that an evolutionary step, as you say, or is it a? To, to me, it is. Um, but again, because Apple didn't build the contactless standards, they didn't issue the cards to Yorn's point. They're not compliant in the sense that they're the, the one underwriting uh, the risk or the transaction. So, you know, MasterCard, I, I don't know, you, know, you tell me, but 2003 was the first time I did a contactless project uh, with, with Visa in the States. You know, contactless cards in markets like Australia, you know, they, they are the predominant way people pay. For Apple in those markets, they've got to provide more value. Actually, in Australia, what they've done is because the government's come in and allowed driver's licenses and other credentials to go in there, they have actually have, have another reason to be relevant. But at the end of the day, it is evolutionary and consumers still have choice. As a matter of fact, well, well I'm glad you used your watch and worked well. I've had enough not great experience. Like sometimes my phone works on the tube and sometimes it doesn't that I've gone back to cards just because I know every time I, it'll go through, I'm not going to get crushed by the stampede <laughs> at rush hour. And, uh, and, and that, that's exactly right. P people do indeed say, oh, well, big tech, they've solved all these technical problems. The reality is that all, all your phone or your watch does here is, well, we've embedded the card in there and you can do exactly the same transaction with your card. The tech, meaning the contactless uh, specification is built by the networks. The um, application that sits on the chip of your cards is the same application that sits on the chip in your phone. The processing of the transaction happens by the networks and by the, by the banks. Uh, what the device does is a beautiful experience, I mean, really beautiful experience, and they bring the biometrics as a security factor that replaces a pin, which is a bit of a uh, 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 like an old school thing, right? For for, for consumers, so it's an evolution, as uh, as Jim says, more than a revolution, uh, and one that I think benefits uh, uh, many many people. Absolutely, and I think ultimately, right, it's underpinned by the banks. So I think a lot of this is convenience of the consumer that we see today. That is really it. So big tech really has pushed the needle on convenience, instant, making things simple, making things less complex. And also kind of just you have your phone, it can kind of, it's a one-stop shop to do many things. And so, but ultimately in the background, it is still underpinned by the banks, underpinned by the payments landscape and the regulatory landscape that we have to navigate. And so ultimately, I think big tech sort of pushes the needle, continues to help innovate the industry. But I still see a very symbiotic, as you guys have said, partnership and relationships in this market. Um, 
So it's definitely an interesting time. I think the last five years, we've sort of seen the most sort of happen in this particular space. But ultimately, yeah, still still definitely underpinned by the the, the banking ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, that's what good new players. And, and actually, if we talk about something like Uber, you know, and, and back to your point, there's, you know, we're using, you know, Google's maps and we're using, you know, payment APIs and we're using, you know, uh, the roads that the cars, you know, but it's the way that those things are being put together that fundamentally solves a different problem for people, isn't it? And it's, it's an interesting one on that, though, because actually, I, I guess, you know, financial services is heavily regulated, you know, uh, for everything that all of you do, you know, there's a regulator that'll come and knock on your door if you don't do it well, or don't have the documentation or don't treat customers in the way that they would want you to do, right? Is that an interesting sort of, are we an interesting sort of watershed moment, should we say, which makes it sound way more dramatic than I intended to, uh, in the industry where, you know, this is really a bit of a bifurcation of the people creating the experiences direct to consumers and then the the underlying fabric of the industry. Because as you say, the, you know, the, the rails here, you know, we've had faster payments in the UK for a really long time. Awesome. Facilitating that through the services that really customers benefit from, is that the job of the traditional FIs? Or is that the thing that we're really talking about is shifting to to people who are really good at it? You know, Apple and Google and Facebook and these guys, like they get customer experience really well. Uh, maybe starting with you, Alexandra, and we'll, we'll go back in the room. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I see this really, you know, ClearBank does something, embedded banking, embedded finance, banking as a service, many different ways that you want to label a very similar activity, which is we are the infrastructure in the background. So allowing the big techs to do what they do extremely well. It is that, un- that consumer experience, but underpinning this with being able to hold your monies at the central bank, which maybe the end consumer doesn't necessarily understand or care to understand in that sense of we actually have that security or in the monies, we're able to then ensure the compliance against each and every payment scheme. You know, landscapes are, they change from the UK to Europe to the US. And I think a lot of this is, I see that real partnership between letting big tech continue to push the needle on different instruments to allow consumers to do different things, ease on their phone or whichever way that you want to do it, but ultimately then sort of bringing that back to actually let potentially like the, in an embedded banking scenario, we hold accounts and we sort of do all of the heavy lifting in the background as infrastructure. So I do see that banks now are kind of coming into that play of how do they move the needle and support these big these big techs, but also equally challenge back to the regulator, say we need to do things more simply, easier, faster, we need more transparency, and equally being able to enable things to be more global. So I think there's definitely a shift, but ultimately I think uh, you know, I think there's now the way that we think about it is how can we work as a collective instead of in silos? So, you know, I think we're going to be more powerful as that collective than sort of working in, in different in different pillars. Yeah. And I guess, you know, one thing to maybe highlight there is the the sort of lines that are increasingly blurred. You know, we sort of had payments players, we had, you know, big tech players, we had FIs you know, increasingly people are sort of straddling more of those buckets, aren't we? We're seeing Apple acquiring, you know, people like Credit Kudos. We're, you know, seeing various different organizations, uh, you know, hoover up either talent to understand, you know, we've seen a lot of people go to Facebook from the regulator, you know, to understand cryptocurrencies and the rails that that could bring from an industry perspective. So, I mean, it is a kind of a quite a blurring of the lines of what big tech, what big payments, what you know, consumer facing brands really are. It, it's, I mean, it makes it fun, fun industry to work in, doesn't it? In that sense. Yeah. Look, I, I, Alexander mentioned it. There's like, I, I think the, the, the buzzword beyond generative AI and beyond uh, uh, blockchain, the buzzword, the fundamental buzzword among VCs and, uh, and PEs is embedded finance. And what it essentially means is that services that traditionally are directly offered by financial services are now offered through third parties, but still it's financial services uh, uh, products. And wh- while that's great because they it, it often uh, results in a better experience, you quickly come to the point around, well, what's is there a level playing field here on the regulatory side? And are certain financial institutions held to a different standard than those that distribute the product and stamp their brand on it? And I think I think that's that's probably a very delicate uh, set of uh, balances that will need to be navigated over the next couple of years. Um, and I think a number of regulators you know, are now really wrestling with that because they see the enormous power of reach and frankly of, of, um, of access that some of these players have. And, 
and and the difficulty of of, of regulating it. Yeah, I mean, I'd say on on that, and that's probably a very nice transitionary point, if I'm honest with you, because actually the relationships work when they're in balance, don't they? But actually, as different players become, you know, more. Uh, sizable in the market in that sense than actually you know making those relationships uh, balance continually with all of the regulatory obligations and everything that goes in that i mean i mean jim what do you see as the challenges in that space because i mean you, there's no single referee to do those things, particularly when you're talking about big tech, right? The head of the regulator recently said to me, "Is like uh, the banks always pick up the phone when I ring, but Facebook not so much." You know, like yeah. so, it's a it's an interesting challenge. Yeah, but uh, but again, I, I think most of the the big tech companies don't they're they're already under a lot of scrutiny. So now the last thing they want to do is now be a, a, a regulated financial institution with you know that camel's nose under their tent. Um, not to say they haven't done it. I mean, over my history, like I started at Visa in 1999 in California when PayPal was still relatively nascent. And I spent a lot of time on the phone telling them, you're, you're breaking things. And not just like for Visa or MasterCard, but, but they were plowing new ground. There was no such thing as aggregation or wallets in that sense. But they, they, were, they were breaking rules. They were breaking Reg E. And, and we were on the fly. They were literally changing their terms and conditions daily. You know, when we did Apple Pay in the U.S., there was Durban regulation around uh, debit qualifications and, and unaffiliated networks. You needed a PIN network and a and Visa and MasterCard, and they didn't think about that. So, so inevitably, I think the smarter tech companies actually work within the system uh, to try to at least work with people that are uh, like like uh, banks and, and and those partners because they are the regulated entity and the networks because they've got a lot of experience. Um, but, but that doesn't mean they all do it. And so, if you go back to um, you know what happened at Meta with uh, Libra. As an example, that was completely, you know, I mean, you could call it innovative, but it was also way out in front of everybody such that it, it, it just disappeared. I mean, it, they had no – it, it just kind of went too far too fast. Um, so, so I do think there is a balance there, um, and I think the smarter folks kind of try to play within the system. They've learned the hard way. Yeah. It's, um, well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? If you've worked within financial services – for such a long period of time, everybody always in big FIs always use the regulation as a reason why things won't happen. But often to your point, whether it's PayPal or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, they're, they're coming at it from a, you know, ignorance is not a kind way of saying what I'm trying to say, but but almost an innocence yeah. in that sense. Like, like, I, like I mentioned, like when, again, when I started and Jorn, I'm not sure exactly when you started there, but we, we had Visa were still, okay, so he, he started there when they were, they were not public, I imagine. I, I started when Visa was not public. And we were a bank-owned association there to serve the banks who were on our boards. So it was a really weird environment. And and here we were in California, MasterCard's headquartered in New York. You've got you know very large you know bases of tech companies in both places, and we didn't talk to them. They had no place to go. And the way I used to describe it is, they're they're inherently engineers. You'd go to a meeting in my early days at Visa, and someone pop open a laptop at Google or Apple, and they start saying, well, "Where are your APIs?" And we're like, well, "APIs? What are you talking about?" And, and, and what, what you found, though, was because they're engineers and they're problem solvers, they'd look at the spaghetti code that we've all been describing of, you know, this pipe goes here and it goes to the bank this way, whether it's real-time rails or card rails, and they, they want to solve it. And they start drawing lines on the board like, oh, well, we're going to solve this for you. And we're going to boom, boom, boom. And, and then stuff starts breaking. Mm-hmm. So I think, again, they've, they've, they've learned the hard way that, that they've got to work within the system. Otherwise, they may be able to most, build the most elegant you know, engineered payment system that doesn't work for anybody. Yeah. Well, and obviously payments is a global thing. You know, this isn't a single <laughs> box of spaghetti. Right. It's uh, several thousand boxes of spaghetti with different regulators globally. And, you know, so actually, uh, you know, it is nice to look at things in a slightly naive way and ask, why is that done? But sometimes it's not changeable, isn't it, in the global payment system, getting different geos to, to talk to one another. That is a real challenge. But I think, again, again unlike the Netflix thing, what is what is quite unique in this is it's a true network, right? Uh, you really need to stitch together thousands of institutions that somehow align to the same conventions and the same agreements and share liabilities and share risks. Um, and, and, and that balance is... Uh, has been constructed over 60 years. You're right to say, if a new player comes in and you snout in the trough, so to speak, that kind of is uneasy and could break some of those balances. And we've seen, you know, the last 20 years littered with great payment initiatives, huge energy, huge amount of funding that just fell over because that balance wasn't wasn't there. 
Uh, and, and I think that is something to be to be careful about. There's a lot of tension at the moment, a lot of wariness on on where this is going to go and how do we keep that balance intact and how don't we create enormous chokeholds in the industry um, uh, out there. And uh, yeah, it's not easy to navigate. There's a reason why I look 15 years older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess to that point, there's there's not a... I mean, it's it's a fundamental uh, underpinning fabric of the industry that money can move from me to you or across the world. But but I guess there's not a this is not purely a uh, altruistic big tech players getting into the industry. There's a lot of money here. You know, there's a lot of money potential. You know, I, I think Apple, what is it, three percent of their revenue total is now coming from financial services for somebody who isn't regulated. I'm not saying they should be regulated, but I'm saying they make a hell of a lot of money and 3% of it is a hell of a lot of money. So, I mean, I'm probably stating the obvious here, uh, Alexandra, but, you know, getting big tech getting into financial services, particularly when they're not going to be regulated, I mean, if they can get slices of the revenue without all of the pain in the ass of, you know, the regulator and everything that goes with it, that sounds like a very good idea, doesn't it? Absolutely, right? I mean, I think they've kind of found that secret sauce in that financial services area, being able to do these types of payments. And I mean, I think the way that I look at it, though, is there's a massive cultural shift that's going on, right? You have big you have big tech, they continue to push the boundaries, they continue to experiment, they trial, they error, they fall over, they do great. Apple's a great example of that, right? 3% of revenue, that's fantastic. But I do think that the the on the flip side of that is regulators are still trying to sort of find their feet in some places and figure out this new breed of organization and how they're operating and what and how do they, do they act upon these types of scenarios. And so I do think that there is this kind of double-edged sword where it's we see things growing, we see things happening, but equally we still have to be considered at the pace in which big tech is pushing out these new initiatives to ensure that ultimately the end consumer is always protected, which of course every company is going to make sure that they try and endeavor the best that they can. But it is a constant struggle looking at, you know, how do banks also operate in that space against some of these uh, some of these big tech giants and working maybe in more as most in a symbiotic relationship as possible. But really uh, it, I think there's a very fine line at the moment in that space. Jim, do you, do you think uh, I mean it's lovely when everybody plays nicely together, like, but it doesn't always work out, does it? I mean, Amazon have got quite a decent track record of selling everybody else's products until they want to sell their own products. And then they're sort of cutting people through the value chain and, and taking all of the revenue, not just the bit of the revenue that they can get. I, I mean, do you think the the balance in the relationship is purely because of the, the need for regulated parties? or Or do you think it becomes more more really the big tech players just not wanting to get fully into financial services? A, a little bit of both. In the case of Amazon, I mean, to your point, like the, they're a very large merchant, uh, the largest merchant for a lot of the card networks. I mean, we all shop there. They, to your point, they've, they've become very big. And given they've got things like Prime and ways to entice – and digitally, by the way, not like uh, a physical world retailer. They've got a fairly easy uh, – frictionless way to give people reasons to switch their payment methods. They haven't ever really become Machiavellian with that. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. One, they understand that consumers want choice and they don't want to interrupt the checkout. But but equally, the payments business is a two-sided business. There are, there are acceptors, the merchants, and, and the consumers. And for Amazon to, to do that, not only in its ecosystem, but to try to grow it as a separate kind of payment system outside, they've, they've tried it. But no merchant wants to take an Amazon payment rail because they know now you're getting all that payment data getting sucked out that you can start figuring out, okay, what's selling or at least that's the thinking. So they've got one side of the network in that they've got all these consumers and a lot of data about those consumers in their in their store, so to speak. But to get outside of that is very difficult given their business. They're, they're not necessarily trusted on the other side of the network. So, so you know, look, they, they, they're very smart people. They'll negotiate very well. But but they see, I think, payments to a large degree as something that drives their real business, which is selling things. And they don't want to get in that business because they, they have, you know, millions, well, more than millions, hundreds of millions, billions of consumers that are carrying opens to open to buy and they want to sell something. And they inserting themselves in a way that tries to change that is a real balance for them. Do, do you think it's a – and, and you, you will know this 
better than than me having spent much more time in Silicon Valley than I have. But I mean, there's only so many al- aluminium laptops and phones you can sell to people until market saturation. I mean, is this a, just an, an eventuality of like very smart people looking for areas of market share growth? You know, because essentially, and actually, I guess more of a, a transitionary point of where we are in the, you know, the, the changing of the fabric of financial services when it comes to payments, because the people who ultimately own the customer engagement, you know, operating system managers and everything that goes with it, it it's sort of back, back to your point uh, earlier on around embedded as well. It's it's really the people who own the customer interaction are the people who really own the yeah. the decision making. But you know, you you wouldn't imagine the number of conversations I've had with people that believe in a transaction, like a retail transaction, who owns the customer. The merchant will say they own it. I've had people that sell point of sale devices say the the, the literally the thing on the counter, I own it. You, like you said, operating system people say they own it. The people that own the telco say they own it. The the networks, uh, the card networks would say, or or whoever else would say they own it. The bank says they own it, and then everyone debates over who owns that customer. And it, it's it's shared, obviously, but but the control at the end of the day exists is with the consumer. Um, I, I would argue nobody owns the consumer. We all have to earn the right to serve the consumer and. At every transaction, to your point, there is a merchant, there is an OS, there is a device, there is a car, there is a bank, and we, there is a telco, and we all have the right to offer the best services. And, and that ownership debate is a little bit ridiculous. Now, it's true, though, that the UX has, has a big influence on consumer choice. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with consumers being lazy. I want to, to have the, the very easiest uh, thing in front of them. But, but that gives them more, I think, sway than perhaps some of the other parties in the chain. I think that's right. I think it's an interesting point around, I mean, we've gone from arguing about who owns, you know, share of wallets to, you know, who owns the, you know, things that are being put on a toolbar to then who's in Apple's wallet, isn't it? But uh, let, let's take a, a quick break. We'll be back very shortly to talk a little bit more about the, the future, though, because I, I think the what comes next is probably going to be um, way more disruptive than what we've seen today. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider, Blockchain Insider, 11FS Spotlight, 11FS Explores, Open Mic Night, After Dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Okay, so having given a bit of an overview of the relationship as well as obviously the challenges that come with some of those relationships, uh, maybe if we dive into the future of uh, really what this space could hold for everybody in that that value chain, um, I mean, all relationships, we look for that happier. I feel like we're getting a little bit blind date here, but uh, the happily ever after uh, kind of moment in that sense. But I guess in these relationships, as, as you were talking about a second ago, the the power structures is shifting continually, isn't it? You've got uh, new startups with, you know, 10 million in a community coming to the front to that have a different dynamic. So, I mean, is there a a really a, a, hev- a happy ever after or is it a, a constant equilibrium we're trying to find? Well, so, so firstly, the, the the great thing about payments, uh, and that's why it's been fantastic to be in this business for a long time now, is it's not a zero-sum game. It's not because somebody wins that somebody else loses. Right? The so much cash in the system still that will be electronified. There's so much friction that will be eased up, and that just means that that cake keeps growing and is able to feed you know uh, uh, a lot of people concurrently. So, so I actually think. I am very bullish on on the future. At the same time, I am what 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 I would call. I suffer from confident paranoia. I'm confident in the business models. I'm confident in the future, but I'm paranoid about when that balance gets, you know, tipped off. I'm paranoid about when regulators uh, put their foot down on sovereignty and on national interests. What that means for that kind of very complex and therefore quite a tricky, tricky ecosystem. But but despite all that, I mean, I, I kind of often say uh, in, 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 I mean, and Jim will remember that in 2000 and 
eight, the telcos were going to take everything over. Uh, and then it was the digital kind of uh, OSs that were going to take everything over. And it was the Chinese players that would take everything over. And that was the crypto players that would take everything over. And the social networks would take... Uh, yes, they're all, they're all come at us uh, in different ways. They all want to put this snout in the, in the trough, so to speak. But by the by, we've always find... Um, We've always find ways to co cooperate, cohabitate, uh, find the balance in there. And that is because, indeed, it's not a zero-sum game. And it's also because of the incredible strength of open-loop networks. Yeah. Closed loop, like Oyster, at the end of the day, is less convenient for consumer than, than open-loop. And I think that's why, at the end of the day, it, we, we find pathways. And, and I'm pretty confident, despite all the... I'm pretty confident without being overconfident or by, by, without being a cavalier about it that, that um, we'll continue to see that kind of growth. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting the the point you make on the closed loop to then open loop. And actually, I mean, if if you look at any sort of uh, ecosystem where that's happened, there's been a, an explosion in opportunities of people, custom and demand and technology players trying to take them outside of those closed loops. So, they? Oyster is a great example. The uh, Gao train in South Africa, the uh, over in Hong Kong or Singapore, you know, transportation and getting, you know, my first few experiences with Apple Pay was being nervous on a bus, which if you Anybody from London, you're nervous on buses most of the time, if I'm honest with you, but it was just a different reason. Um, but it's it's an interesting point, isn't it, that as humans, we have to remember that actually, you know, not everybody is like us listening to this podcast. Like most people are just a bit scared of getting it wrong and looking foolish. So trying these things out and getting confident and, and comfortable with them and then blowing it up into, well, everything you can do on these things. In the same way as Apple Pay, we could do you know, or contactless, we could do twenty pounds, and and now you can buy a car on it, right? So it's it's very it's very different as people get used to it, isn't it? True, and and um, and I mean, you mentioned Amazon, we mentioned PayPal before. At the end of the day, there's so much comfort in knowing that your product can work everywhere, and 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 the moment you have. You ask regular consumers to start navigating oh, for this, I need that instrument, for that, you need that instrument. It's just too much trouble. Nobody wants to think about payments. <laughs> However much I like to think about it, nobody wants to think about payments. They want to do something else. 100%. Yeah. As much as we talk to all of our families, nobody else wants to know about it, do they? But, Alexandra, what, what do you think? I mean, what, do the, what does the ideal relationship look like between big tech and payments in the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, I see it as competition, not competition. So I really see that cooperation coming in. To, to play. So I think, you know, as I kind of said earlier, banks underpin a lot of what happens in the background, right? And I really see that continuing to, to push the needle. You know, consumers seek convenience, so behaviors are going to mimic that. So it's how sort of big tech are going to service that and how ultimately for us in the background are, are going to sort of help, help orchestrate all of that going on, you know, giving faster, easier, more seamless sort of transitions for for the big techs to integrate into us in, in various different ways. But, you know, as I kind of said earlier, and I, I continue to sort of bang that drum is we're stronger as a collective than we are in silos. So if we're solving these together, we can go to this with the regulators and help push the needle, help influence change in the markets, and equally look at this more on a global scale than versus silos and markets. Because I think we still have the complexities that we see, the US, the UK, Europe, APAC, LATAM, they're all different landscapes with lots of different sort of silos still at play. So, you know, my first perspective as a bank and looking at the international landscape from a payments perspective is how do we then look at it from supporting the end consumer also to be able to send payments to lots of different places across the globe with not having to think about it, right? Because a, a thought that was said earlier is people don't really care about the payments. They just want to send something from A to B. And so, again, it's really consumers see convenience and behaviors mimic that, right? So it's the ease of how they can do that really simply. And, and do you think, um, I completely agree with that. I mean, do you think a, a lot of what we've talked about today has been consumer as in, you know, B2C, but obviously the same sort of disruption is very much happening in the the sort of B2B corporate sense, right? And and the scale of the, the transactions, the scale of the money movement, uh, you know, managing a global treasury function for, a, you know, a gigantic organization is, you know, same thing, same rails, but obviously very different impact. So do you expect a, a similar conversation with the B2B or, or corporate space as well? Absolutely. I, I see it just, just as powerful as what we've kind of seen happen in the consumer space. I mean, big tech, in his very nature is bringing new technologies and enabling capabilities. So it makes perfect sense in that B2B space. 
and they can really power and back all the business and enable two n- new technologies, right? So really pushing the boundaries of the B2B space today and how these corporates operate and looking at it from that, again, that global scale, right? It's how these, this B2B space globalization and how that that they're able to enter those spaces is fundamental. And I think big tech is really pushing the needle on that, particularly in this space. So one thing, I guess, Jim, we talked about a little bit earlier on as well is, I mean, uh, I was going to try and stretch the metaphor of relationships then, but sometimes relationships go all the way through to m and I'm not sure what that would be in the sense of a relationship. I'm pretty sure I've crossed a line in the editors. I'll try and take that out at some point. But, uh, um, but um, you know, m and is obviously a big play in this space. I mean, and, and MasterCard as well, you guys have got a great track record of, of acquiring technology companies that complement your skill sets. Um, do you think m and are a big part forward here? Do you think the lines will get even more blurred between companies? Yeah, I, I think th- there's a space for it, but I think we, you've heard consistently throughout this from all of us that it, it's about cooperation or, or, or cooperation or working together. I'm not so sure. Uh, I think there'll be tuck-ins, smaller things that fit. So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the consumer side of Apple Pay. You know, Apple's made acquisitions on the merchant side where now the phone, you can tap to a phone. So I think they're looking for areas where they can pick up technology that will help them accelerate into those. Um, but but I think generally speaking, I, I don't see a lot of the big tech folks coming in and acquiring folks in the payment space per se. What, what about the other way around? Because obviously from somebody like MasterCard's perspective, I mean, you guys are payments, uh, and we talked about this uh, last week, Jim, in, uh, in Amsterdam, but you know, payments is a stack. Increasingly, the more interesting things are happening further and further up that stack with the capability you can bring for data or, you know, really shining a light on that in terms of showing consumers what what good looks like or, you know, payment flows in different places to understand where people really are. I mean, the, the world really is endless at that point when you're using all of the metadata you can get around payments to to really enrich services. It, I know this is something that you guys have acquired some companies and added them to the, the estate that you guys can, can really bring to your clients. But that has to be a big part, I guess, of uh, not wanting to nod slowly if this is okay and you don't want to broadcast it on the note. No, no, it's, uh, look, it, it's... it's um like I think most other companies, uh, you first have to know what you are, right? We are fundamentally a B2B2C company. So that means that we're not going to buy a B2C player. That's not what we do. We are servicing banks and partners, and that's what we'll continue to do. We are very, very concerned with things like privacy, and therefore we're very thoughtful about data. And therefore, within these boundaries, we will we will make uh, very careful choices. But but once you know what you are, once you know where you want to go, then then buy build partner is 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 a an equation that we need to make. And very often, like Jim and Alexander mentioned, partner is actually the way forward because you know you can't buy your way through the digital transition, right? So that would be very expensive and, and it's such a complex market. But 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 uh, you know we're building quite a bit as well and and I uh, I am at heart, a builder, uh, but but I uh, but yeah, opportunistically we will buy and we will look to to nudge and certainly in in, in some of the more up and coming uh, technologies, we're, we're looking to make sure that we um, have a seat at the table and can uh, and can play. We won't buy a big tech if that was where you're kind of <laughs> poking at. Yeah, Be- Bezos can uh, rest <laughs> uh, rest assured. Just uh, just uh, never say never, though, right? You know, but, but say- I do think though there's some adjacencies though, so it's not a direct kind of. Um, M&A uh, activity in, in the payment space. But I think, as Jorn knows, underwriting is at the heart of payments and risk. And so I think in the identity space, a lot of places where, again, the tech companies have, have a leg up either because of their data or their UX or UI or the, the amount of consumers and merchants, that, that's a very powerful thing. And if you combine it with technology, identity, um, and and the ability to underwrite based on you know seeing lots of payment information is very powerful. So I think you'll see areas where they come in either to help them themselves um, you know, in the payment space, either as a merchant or as a, a, a player in there. But but back to Apple Pay, um, the thing we didn't talk about, like things like tokens, that no one would have done that. There was no big push. And it was one of the things where inside of Visa, we said we'd never do something like that. And Apple was the impetus to do that. And, and now it's, it's one of the big things. And, and I would argue payment information safer as a result. Um, and, and, you know, I, I attend this whole conversation. We kind of put the tech companies in a in almost like a scary light. But, you know, P2P exists in a lot of ways because Square kind of jumped into a space that banks didn't want to. Um, and a lot of the things that we're now kind of 
de rigueur for all of us in terms of what we use. It was actually led by an innovator. No, I, and look, I, it's true that we, we they're, they're depicted here a little bit as as the scary ones, but there's no question that cash displacement, new business models, uh, moving into emerging markets, uh, acceptance growth. You know, we've doubled the acceptance locations over the last five years. We'll probably triple it over the next five years simply because these things are unleashed. So they bring a lot of efficiency and a lot of uh, growth to the business. But, you know, it, like I said, we need to be confident and, and a little bit paranoid at times as well. I like the uh, sort of slightly skeptical optimist approach to, to life. That's uh, it's probably quite a, a good balance to have. I, I guess... Um, Bringing it back, because I mean, I think there's probably another four or five hours we could we could talk about all of these things and uh, and definitely get it all out of our system, so we don't have to talk to our families about it. But uh, I guess bringing it back to you know, how does big tech really shake up the payments industry? Is it merely their presence that's making everybody just have to step their game up? What do you think, Jim? No, I, I go back to like I said, if, if you look, you know. PayPal opened up the ability for small and medium merchants you know, on eBay to sell goods and services. People don't remember, but again, I started in 1999. There were escrow services where I'd send like an ACH to a third party. They'd get the goods. They'd open it and say, "It's you know, are the goods real? Did it have real money?" And then it was you know a hostage you know crisis. <laughs> um, you know, so they innovated, and and then we all kind of uh, took it in and, and kind of made it more ubiquitous. Um, you know, Apple, again, like w- with the phone, up until that point, it was it was a hodgepodge of, you know, SIM rentals and it wasn't scaling. There was all these fighting and they coalesced and, and tokens were, were hatched, which which is really, I think, the game-changing message. Um, I mentioned P2P. The industry, and, and it's, by the way, I always say this, it's not because banks don't want to be innovative. I've got a lot of friends over 20, 30 plus years in this space that want to innovate, but because they're a compliant entity, you know, they're dealing with a, with a, a stack of paperwork and things that I don't want to see every day. They, they want to go fast. It's just difficult to do with, with what they live in. And as a result, a lot of times things that are, that are clear problems for merchants, for uh, enterprises, or for, for consumers just go they don't get get addressed. What I find that's been great about big tech and tech generally is they just go right to Jorn's point, the, the UX, the UI, and they try to fix it. Now, they don't always get it right, but you know, in cooperation with you know, Alexander's company, with Jorn's company, with the companies like Thread, we can work together to actually solve those things. But you sometimes need a, you know, a swift kick in the butt to get going. Solving customer problems, that's the, the, the big thing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an evolution, not a revolution from big tech, right? I think we they continue to, to just push the boundaries, wanting to do things bigger, faster, and different from what we've ever seen before. And so I think ultimately, in sort of the banking space, sort of a critical part of banks is actually lobbying with the regulators and actually then pushing the regulators kind of forward and bringing them up to speed in line with the big tech as well. And I think that is really important. It's actually being, the banks actually being a little bit of the sounding voice behind the scenes, sort of bringing the regulators along to the journey and helping that education and showing them the various use cases, how we can bank wider, bank the unbanked, do lots of interesting things, you know, help various segments, whether it's B2C, B2B. I mean, there's so much that we can do as this evolution evolves. And you know, I think, again, that partnerships angle is extraordinarily important. You have the subject matter experts sitting in banks who understand the intricacies, but equally then, with that expertise, that's really then what can move the needle on the regulation side. So that big tech and all of these fantastic companies continue to do what they do, but equally then the banks in the background continue to keep the financial stability, right? It's ensuring that we're plugged into central banks and able to then ensure that payments and data and privacy and all of these things are thought about and equally, you know, battling things like AML and sanctions, compliance and all of these things that, you know, don't necessarily matter to the originating person of that particular payment. So, you know, again, evolution, not revolution in this space for sure. Jorn, last word for you. What, what do you think? Has the the big tech scene really shaken the, the payments infrastructure so far? I think, again, we started with saying this evolution, revolution. I think the one thing that we haven't talked about today, which I think is unbelievably important in this space, is the whole notion of trust. Right? We're not talking about pictures of cats. We're talking about people's money, their livelihoods, their family. And uh, we shouldn't tinker with this uh, unless we really know it's very secure. And we should make sure that the 
there is confidence in the system. That's 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 fragile. And so you mentioned Meta hasn't succeeded because they're way ahead. There's other reasons why they haven't succeeded. Uh, and I think I think uh, there's a reason why this big tech is working with the traditional financial industry. And I think a big reason of that is not just regulation. It is trust that people have in their financial institutions, in brands like Mastercard and others. And um, I, I don't think we should just dismiss that. Yes, you know, Apple is a trusted brand as well, but this is a slightly different, well, very different uh, ecosystem. So I, I, I actually think um, it's uh, it's definitely an, an evolution, and we'll see much more evolution. And I, um, as a as a as a big believer in private enterprise and competition, bring it on. I would say very good. It's um it's an interesting one, isn't it? And as a as an industry, as somebody who sat in a big bank trying to get a transformation program going. Uh, I gave them all of the upside, I gave them all of the downside, but the thing that really got them to part with billions of pounds to make it happen was the threat of big tech coming into the industry. So for whatever reason, I think it's a great thing. It's uh, made everybody step their game up and, and definitely made the uh, the customer experiences at the end of it uh, a much better place than, uh, than they were before they were in it. So uh, on that note, we better wrap up today's discussion though. So thank you so much for joining me, everybody. Uh, where can people find a little bit more about you and your companies? Jim, starting with you. Thread.com is the website, and it's jim.mccarthy at thread.com if anyone wants to reach me. Very good. Alexandra? Yep, you can find ClearBank at clear.bank, and you can find me on LinkedIn at Alexandra Rivascale. Very good. Jorn? Well, mastercard.com slash newsroom, I was told, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Jorn Lambert. Very good. Uh, I'm predominantly lurking on LinkedIn, so you can find me over there. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you've heard, subscribe to the podcast and don't forget to leave us a review. It helps us make it better and helps other people find the show as well. As always, if you want to join the conversation, you can find us on social media. Just search for 11FS or Fintech Insider, wherever you fancy doing it, or email us on podcast at 11FS.com. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Bye.